Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello and welcome to the Dementia Researcher podcast, on location from the Alzheimer Europe conference, which this year is taking place in Bucharest in the heart of Romania. I'm Adam Smith, and today I have the pleasure of hosting this special podcast to share our highlights from this brilliant three-day conference. Don't worry, I'm not here alone. I have five wonderful guests who've all been taking detailed and copious notes over the last few days <laughs> to give you a comprehensive essay. You have all been taking detailed notes, yeah, right? Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Well, as this is one of the few research conferences where we actually have people living with dementia attending, I'm delighted to introduce the first of our two guests who can represent those attendees. We have Chris Roberts and Jane Goodrick. Hello. Hello. Hi. Next, we come to the researchers and we have the incredible Dr. Joni Gilson. We have the wonderful Charlet Dupont and the amazing Simone Felding. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for joining us today. So let's start by going around the microphones and getting some introductions. Chris and Jane. Chris, why don't you go first? Yeah, I'm Chris Roberts. I'm chair of the European Working Group of People with Dementia. And um, I live in North Wales in the UK. Um, I, I'm, I'm um, living with um, dementia myself, um, mixed dementia. Firstly, diagnosed with vascular and then later on with um, Alzheimer's as well. But see now, I, I'm also living with um, emphysema or lung disease. My wife just said I'm greedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we laugh, but I mean, it's very serious, of course. Out, out of all, just out of interest, out of all those problems that you have to live with each day, which one do you think affects you the most? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> No, she, no, she's it's, laughing. It's, just it's, 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 it, 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 it actually, um, I can't remember the words now, but um, my dementia has gone a lot worse, um, especially over the, the COVID period. Um, like a lot of people's, actually, I think it's lack of stimulation and being in, you know, and, and not mixing. But um, um, when my emphysema um, kicks off or I get an infection, it does actually make my dementia much worse. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for taking time to join us. And, and Jane, you yes. can get your own back on him now. <laughs> <laughs> As you've heard, my name's Jane. Uh, um, I use my maiden name. I'm Jane Goodrick. Um, I'm married to Chris. We've been married 28 years. Uh, I li also live in North Wales with Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I've been given the label of carer, but we prefer to call ourselves husband and wife because we're a much better team as husband and wife. Um, I am involved with a, a charity that's really close to my heart, Dementia Carers Count. I'm on the advisory panel for them uh, to give my lived experience and to help them, uh, to help inform their, their production of services. They upskill carers like me in the role of caring. Um, they have a virtual carers centre on their website, so it can be accessed by anybody all over the world. That's good. And actually, the uh, care is, caring is one of the real focuses of this particular conference as well. So it's great that you can, can share that with us. So you both kind of left your old lives behind and you, you kind of started this, this, new, this <laughs> new life. Not through choice. No, no, no. of course not no, at all. No. But you're, you're massive icons and, and absolutely have impacted so much in research. I, when you, be, you were some of our very first podcast guests a very long time ago in Exeter. And um, I, I know that those particular shows have been listened to a lot um, and, and still remain some of our most popular ones. Cause well, I just apologise now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some of the very few, because, I mean, obviously our podcast mostly aimed at early career researchers. It's, it's uh, a real privilege to have, uh, have you and your experience. It, it's it's an absolute privilege for us to take part and um, promote the work of early stage researchers. It's fantastic. I, I don't think that researchers and, and, and other, other professionals that deal with um, dementia get the accolade that they deserve most of the time. Well, it's, it's really brilliant that you can both join us. Thank you ever so much again. I'm going to go to the researcher side of the table now. Um, and I'll, ooh, I'll go according to my list, which means I'm going to come to Joni first. Hi, um, so my name is Joni. <laughs> I'm from Belgium. I'm a postdoc researcher um, based in Belgium in Brussels as well as in Ghent. Um, I'm working at the end of life care research group, um, but we're mainly focusing on, on the entire 
disease trajectory of people living with chronic illnesses, um, ranging from people living with dementia, but also people with um, cancer, different types. Um, my personal research is more focused towards um, the post-diagnostic process of people living with dementia, as well as older adults living with cancer and trying to navigate them better in um, accessing services as well as social services as well as healthcare services so, so. thank you very much Shuni and Charlotte yeah thank you indeed Charlotte um, working together with Yoni at the end of life care research group in Belgium Brussels um, I'm actually Dutch um, background in communication and nursing and I'm working in technology and uh, palliative care for people with dementia and especially around how we can um, start as early as possible the conversations about uh, preferences for care and treatment in the future. So you, your background was in nursing, so yes. a, a real nurse. I'm a real nurse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a real I'm a real nurse. Yeah. Do you think you'll ever go back to that with the with the things you've learned from your PhD? Back in practice, I'm not sure. Um, I do like to do some volunteering as a nurse sometimes, also just volunteer work in nursing homes. Um, Thank you, Charlotte. And and of course, last but not least, Simone. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So uh, yeah, my name is Simone Felding, and. Uh, but I'm a social anthropologist. I come from Denmark and I am I'm doing my PhD in, in Germany at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, the tongue breaker, Lisa mm -hmm. Denis in Witten. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about these strange little pet robots that are being used in nursing homes for people with dementia. And specifically, I went back to Denmark to do some ethnographic fieldwork about that. Um, yeah, so I think that's the brief introduction. Of Thank you very much, Simona. Right, let's get down to business. For listeners that don't know this conference, I'll set the scene. The event is organised by Alzheimer Europe, which is a national membership organisation to provide collective representation for 35 European Alzheimer and dementia national groups. As well, and they do lots of special work as well, like, for example, having the European working group that Chris mentioned that he chairs at the start. They take an interest in research, but also in policy and the rights and treatment and support for people living with dementia. Uh, and they're also the state of things, kind of the state of diagnosis across Europe or, or elsewhere in the world. They kind of do surveys and reviews and publish policy documents. And I think they do some, I get the impression they do some lobbying as well. I'm not that close to them. In fact, we might have them back in the future to give a special overview of the kind of work they do. But surprisingly the conference is in its 32nd year which always I didn't quite get the 32 bit in their hashtag which means it's been around a long time so the conference is in its 32nd year it has a really wide program and this week I've seen sessions on all kinds of stuff from national policies support for early career researchers the impact of the war on Ukraine on people living with dementia we've heard about care home research and biomarkers um, the potential for new drug treatments, uh, technology. There really is something for everyone, and that can even include basic scientists, because you don't get a lot of basic scientists here. But I think generally, if they'd like a bit of a big picture as to what's going on outside the lab, this is a great conference to come to, to, to meet people and to, to get a good sense of what's going on. Right, that's enough from me. For anybody who doesn't know the format for these highlight podcasts, Really what we do is we kind of go around the table and say, what did you really like? Uh, with a hope that those who didn't manage to get here over the last few days can learn a little bit about what they missed. Or for those that did, um, it could maybe signpost you to some of the sessions you didn't see. Because, of course, this was also a hybrid conference. So all the sessions from the last three days are available online. I'm not sure if you already didn't register whether you can register late and access the content offline but I'll find that out for you and we'll put it in the show notes with a link if there is okay so I'm gonna go around the table and I'm gonna start over here with Simone what have you seen this week Simone that that really caught your eye you've got a lot of notes in front of you <laughs> <laughs> I'm an excessive note taker I've always have been and it's my way of listening but I have so many that I lost the overview as always <laughs> But uh, I find this task really hard. There's been so much to see and I've met so many incredible people and I'm completely packed with all these new impressions and all the 
the love as well. I feel like it's a very, um, it's always very emotional for me also with, with Jane and Chris that I really appreciate a lot and have seen a couple of times before. Um, I think one of the sessions that I found really important was the one on intersectionality. That was, uh, well, it was my supervisor, <laughs> Martina Reus. Uh, yeah, it's not only, that. no, it's not, it's really not only because of that. And then Hurem, I'm not sure how to say her name, Tetsan Quintelin and Caroline Smith. Yeah. And uh, I, I found that really inspiring to remember that when we talk about people with dementia, it's not a homogenous group. It's a lot of different people all over the world. And one of the examples there was even if you look at people with a Turkish migration background in Germany, it's still a homo homogenous group. They might have different gender identities or different sexualities, or you might come from a, a different social class. And to really try to, to go into some of these and, and not just say, I mean, we've, there have been some first steps that are very important in getting better post-diagnostic support or getting better, better access, but really to also look at what about the people, who are the people who are being left behind, who are the people who cannot talk to the people in the hospital, who are the people who don't know about these services or who experience racism in German hospitals. And do you think, because that is particularly difficult, isn't it? I think, you know, when you're, as a government or as a policy maker, when you're trying to create services that will catch, the, because you're kind of interested in the majority, you're not, not interested in the minority, but you're interested in the majority because you'll help more people if you spend your money on some generic service. But you know then immediately you're going to leave behind certain certain people. Do you think they have to then make sure that they can try and tackle all that in one go? Or do they, do, is, do they have to kind of break it down? Is it okay to prioritise and say, well, we'll do these first and we'll do you guys later? I don't think it is because I think then they just never get round to them. If you yeah, like. and I think, I, I mean, in Denmark where I come from, we've, we have much more in, uh, inequality in healthcare is really on the rise. We see more and more of it. We see that people who have a lower income, they also go to the doctor less often. They have more motor morbidities. So I think it's actually the most important is to target this group, not the majority, that it's already uh, literate about health. Yeah, I, I can see what you mean. You, you, you really do have to, even though it might mean diverting some attention to another area that might not uh, as have the impact straight away, you've got to support all people. And I think it's a little bit shame because it feels like a, a, we're coming to that concept a little bit late. Mm -hmm. It's only when the stats have been presented to show that dementia is going to be a bigger problem in, say, sub-Saharan Africa or in parts of Central America and places like that, that, oh, we should look at those areas then. Well, it, it, yeah, we should have been doing that for quite a while, right? Yeah, and I think it's one of the things that can have the biggest impact also because if you want to look at it from a, a perspective where you look at money, you, I think these are also the people who have, who, who have a multi-morbidities and therefore need the health system in many ways. So if you can target them earlier and help them. And also the human rights perspective of it, that the European Working Group of People with Dementia has also been arguing. I think that's also important to say, even though you're not the majority, you're still important, you still have these rights. And, and embed that in your research, particularly for those ECRs listening, embed that from the outset, not say, well, okay, well, first of all, we're gonna, we're gonna get all these people because they're, they're, that's, what do they used to call it? They're the, that, that's the, the light, um, there's an acronym, there's not an acronym, like a saying for this, isn't it? We'll get the, the low hanging fruit. <laughs> The low-hanging fruit, and then we'll get the kind of harder stuff. Actually, I don't think that's a good enough excuse anymore, whether that's recruitment to trials or developing services or dealing with diagnosis or even publishing things in languages. You can't say, oh, well, we'll publish it in English, and yeah, we'll catch up. We'll publish it in other languages a bit later. No, you do it from the start. I completely agree. So, ca so carry on. Yes, so, I mean, of course, I also would like to mention the Building Bridges, Our Voices, Our Lives session mm -hmm. by the European Working Group of People with Dementia. Thank you. I was so emotionally invested in that, that I have no notes. This never happens to me. Mm -hmm. I cried three times. <laughs> I don't have any notes to rely on, but I'm always so impressed with how well-spoken, 
I mean, these speeches, if I could ever do such a, an impactful speech, I would be a very happy woman. And we talk a lot about stigma. I meet a lot of people and they say very hard things like, I would rather die than get this disease. And those are not words that I like to, to say, but I hear this a lot when I talk to people and they worry. I mean, I'm an anthropologist. I work with dementia, it's not so usual, but they work in war zones and they worry about my mental health, working with dementia. And and I think one of the, the best ways to fight the stigma is I just want people to go and listen to you talk because you're so well-spoken, you're so outspoken, you're so honest, you're so proud and yeah. The thing is, you're, you're a long time dead, aren't you? <laughs> you know, and for someone to wish they'd rather die than, than have a life-changing illness, I don't get. Um, I think it's something that people say when they haven't got a life-changing illness. When you have, you've got no choice but to get on with it. So, you know, you, there's no choice. There's no choice. You just have to get on with it. And if I'd thought that way, I would have been dead eight years. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. You do have a choice, and you made a choice to manage your your dementia the way you have, the same as all the other people in the working group. Mm. They made a choice, but it's not always easy. We're, we're in a privileged position that we well, were what able people to make don't see, What people don't see is it probably took us about three months mm. to get that right. Um, meetings where we're giving each other feedback, where we're going over um, the, the writings uh, of each other and, and trying to um, get it all correct, um, but not taken away the story either, and not taking away their words, you know? So there's a lot of work goes into it. And I think, I think you both make important points about how you know, recognising that how you deal with it isn't necessarily how everybody does, because I know some of, the, some of the hardest times I've come across have been early career researchers who suddenly, you know, they get to the stage of their PhD where they've got to go out go out of the university and do, uh, they've prepared their questions, so they've got a qualitative interview lined up and they've done their recruitment and then they suddenly find themselves sat in front of somebody who uh, the kind of, I mean, they maybe have met grandparents or things like that, but living with a disease. If they've no experience of it, it, it can know. be quite daunting, it can be quite frightening. Okay. And that's why I think that, that, that this is why experts by experience come into it, you know, which, we should be visiting um, universities and you know, speaking to the, these guys as soon as they start training so they don't have this figure of engaging with people. And I don't think there's any better way to get experience of that other than to meet people and talk to them because it doesn't matter how much you read about how the symptoms differ and how no two people experience um, you know, different forms of dementia in quite the same way until you actually talk to somebody but there is a lot of similarities know. as oh, well yeah, you know it, it, it's wonderful being with like-minded people you know that don't make assumptions at all mm -hmm. you know at all can i just say that i was very proud of the group i mean i just chaired it i i did nothing and um but they they spoke from the heart um i can't i don't think you can beat a a, a real story from a real person yeah. to change minds with that 70 years of whatever life they lived before combined onto the symptoms, that everybody brings something slightly different to it. Yeah. And, and two, two of the members had never spoke before in public. No, really? Yeah. yeah. So, and that takes, that takes a lot of confidence. After a diagnosis, you lose, you lose confidence. You think you're less of a person. You know, you, it's just human nature. The less you can do, the more useless you think you are and the less you think you can achieve. So it's lovely to, to um, do this and then show people what they can still do. And, and it's so much appreciated because the, the, the vibe at this conference is so much different than others I went to um, because of the involvement of the people from the working group. Um, just the questions that you guys ask after a research presentations are different because of your lived experience and makes us think about our research in a different way, which is very valuable, I, I feel. That's good yeah. to hear. Yeah, absolutely. When you involve people living with dementia at the start of the conference, it, it delivers a very different experience. This conference is very different to many others, even things like Alzheimer's Disease International, because it's so global that they right. even, even 
Yeah. And I think by you guys being here, it's breaking the stigma. It's like understanding. It's so easy to involve you guys, to ask you questions, to build our research based on your experiences. I think it's really important. Well, one of the questions was something like, don't quote me, um, for our symposium from, from someone watching virtually was, was um, what's the criteria for asking us questions? <laughs> And I, I, I said, just ask. Yeah, but, yeah, and I think that's you know, an important thing. It's just ask. If we don't want to answer, we won't. Yeah. You know, I can't speak for everyone, but you know, th there's not a lot. Now, now my, my filters aren't so good. There's not a lot I wouldn't answer. And it's your fault for asking. <laughs> <laughs> but that brings us back to the slight shame of, is, of this is, is that that should be something we would like to try and do more routinely. It shouldn't have to wait until you're at a conference to be able to kind of get that input. We know organisations like Alzheimer's Society have been really good in the UK at kind of providing access to, to people to help in the design of of research studies from the outset and to look at research priorities, but I do think we could be still even better. There's an awful lot of projects going on in Europe where we are contacted immediately mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in the planning process and, and everything. Um, I, I think we, we do much more work in the beginning in Europe than we do in the UK. So maybe even going one step earlier that when the funding calls are announced. In fact, we, this came up at the ECR workshop. I don't know, we, we had an ECR workshop today and talking about one of the things you could help is, is so everybody talks about grant writing support, mm -hmm. but actually rather than getting grant writing support miles ahead that you get like grant specific writing support which would be a package so as a grant is in advance of a grant being announced say right okay six months ahead you could set up writing groups with with people living with dementia with researchers and i think that could be done in basic science as well it, there's no excuse for and not take carrying that across. take an appropriate person that understands what you're doing yeah. to to the interview process for the funding mm -hmm. to well, the ethics committee yeah. with you well, watch this space. We, we will bring, we'll, we will take that idea forward. I'm, I'm going to come back to you. Simone, was there anything else before I move along to Chalet? I, I mean, I could go on, but I think it's, uh, I think oh, it's okay. fair to, <laughs> to we can pass do it on. Discussion. Go on, Chalet. <laughs> tell, us, tell us some of your highlights. It's indeed also difficult because there are so many nice things. But it, what we already talked about, I really liked how the program is built. It's how people with dementia, family caregivers are involved, but also policy. Um, we are talking about how we can involve politics to make changes. And also the more um, inclusive the, the program is compared to um, so many years ago. So for example, I went to the session on sex, gender and sexuality, and it was really inspiring how uh, Barry Moss of the Alzheimer's Association talked about, I don't know if you guys have seen because you're nodding, yeah, uh, of the LBGTQ um, plus community and how they are they're not able to access um, or equal access to social health care and how we should work on that and um, yeah and also the importance of language in that and how we frame things and how we uh, write up and I think that's really uh, so was that specific me. research that they were presenting or was that yeah it was, a, it, it was like issues? it was indeed research uh, about um, how people are excluded or um, not able to um, get the dementia care they, they should receive, for example, or how he, for example, had a story about uh, that he and his husband, he got care was not so, because that's not dementia care, but his husband was ex excluded from his care, for example. He, he, was, a, he was in a coma yeah. and it was in, I won't say the country, but they would not take the husband's instructions they wanted a blood relative that the gentleman in the in the coma had been estranged from for 30 40 years oh, wow. he was in a coma for seven weeks and his husband was not able to sanction anything and that's in this day and age yeah, i think it was yeah. about it was 2014 was it yes, yeah yeah no get no please no, no, and, and yeah. So had they had they done more survey work? Because this is a topic that's come up a few times. I know some people on our WhatsApp group. Uh, this is their research field as well, and I know that they've been looking at this topic as well. Um, was there anything else on that? Yeah, and also, um, but I just summarized a little bit. Didn't go in like 
summarize all the details, but also about, for example, the um, people with intellectual disabilities. I really liked that it was on the program and that there was no research on, for example, uh, couples with one of them or both having intellectual disabilities. And we know for people with Down syndrome, for example, they have a higher risk of dementia. Um, and there were no studies on that. And it just started now. For, there was uh, Professor Karen, Karen Watch. Watcham of the University of Stirling in yeah. Scotland. Yeah, I really liked her work as well. So I liked also as a researcher in palliative care, dementia, to explore new fields that we don't work in as much. Um, so that's great about this program that you can explore. And were they going mm -hmm. more in, was this considering in, in terms of diagnosis or in post-diagnosis So it was also diagnosis, or? yeah. So also about how the, um, the, the existing examination instruments are not really um, that they have to be adapted to people with uh, intellectual disabilities. That, that comes up on languages again, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I haven't heard it talked about for quite some time, but I've definitely seen talks in the past talking mm -hmm. about the, the diagnostic we tools we use not being sophisticated enough to even pick up where English wasn't the first yeah. language or when people have reverted back because of the memory issues that there's some of the English that they might have spent a long time in the UK. Or the problem is that most of the tools that are designed for this kind of work is aimed at the majority and not back always the, the majority the, uh, again. Uh, yeah yeah and we shouldn't be leaving anyone behind as, as you say in disabled rights. We have the same in Wales if somebody reverts back to their um, mother tongue of Welsh if they're what I call proper Welsh uh, proper Welshie, um, mm -hmm. we have we don't have the tools, the diagnostic tools for them. No. They don't translate into into Welsh. So heaven knows how how it, it manages with all the other languages. And, and yeah. the LGBT community plus community, um, th th there's enough stigma. They're fighting stigma for forever, mm -hmm. you know, and they're still fighting stigma, and yet they're just people, yeah. like everyone else. So if, so if somebody's know? in their 70s and they had all that fear of, of when it was all illegal and the the bias and the abuse that they got, okay, they may have, have, have come out now and got over it, but as their dementia, if they get dementia and it progresses, potentially they could revert back to that fear and trying to hide the, their, their sexuality. We've heard stories of people in care homes, transgender, who were being forced to wear the wrong uh, gender clothes. I remember, yeah, some of the early talks I remember on when I started working in dementia were on that same topic. Just, Chalet, as a nurse, yeah. is this exactly the same for, say, um, in mental health care? I'm just trying to think of other things. Obviously, certainly if you have heart disease and things, it, it, maybe it matters less so much things like the diagnostic tools because they're the same. But in, say, in mental health or other conditions like that are psychological in that way, do they, are they all the same? Are we as bad at this in other things or are they better? That's a difficult question. <laughs> And what I'm just trying to get to the point of, is this a problem that's specific to dementia or is actually this a problem for lots of other diseases or long-term conditions in healthcare? It's just that we're just not very good at it. I think that it, for me it's really difficult to say because I didn't... But if I, if I may, so in, in palliative care research and we know from, from if we're looking at end-of-life care and the access of healthcare use at the end of life, like for the last months or years, um, of life, we do see some unequal access in people um, with LGBTQ um, I plus um, backgrounds, or um, so. Yeah, I guess it's it's an issue that is applicable Sorry. to other chronic illnesses as well. I think it's also about realizing uh, pronouns you use as a physician, mm. for example, mm. um, and that's of course in all. Uh, but I, I think what Jane says really shows that there are some specific problems to dementia like mm -hmm. if you are living with a different gender than what you were assigned at birth and then you get dementia and you really have to figure out does this person now wish to live as a woman and just forgets in the morning that that's the clothes to put on or the staff are not putting on the right clothes or helping with this or does this person actually has this person gone back to a time where they were living as a man so i think there are some complicated 
And I would like to recommend that Asama Europe has made a, a report about this uh, sex, gender and sexuality mm-hmm. report that's really insightful. And uh, they they worked with a working group there of people who also have dementia and, and have an LGBTQ plus identity. But, so. but people like the LGBT plus Q, Q plus community and, and people with learning difficulties and, you know, they, they get enough stigma as it is. Mm-hmm. And then when they get dementia as well, it's like a double stigma. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, and then, then refused, and then because they've got all these problems, so normality says, whoever normal is, that they're, they're disallowed operations to make the quality of life better. You know, especially elderly people with dementia, they refused operations for cataracts because the, the doctors think it's a waste of time, yeah. and yet it's going to improve the quality of life. And then maybe for a question for you, um, it's... It's like, for example, when I was working as a nurse, um, working in a nursing home, we had people that had dementia, were vegetarians their whole life, but they forgot. Mm. Um, but we had a menu and there was only meat on the menu. So they, they got meat because they would eat it anyways. So do you think it's really important that we already start talking about the things that might happen when you forget what your values were? Absolutely. Of dementia? Absolutely. We need to start talking about everything and everything much earlier, including dying. You know, that it's, it's one of the things that that's the only positive, that's the only, um, that, that is the only, that's the one thing in your life you can guarantee. Everything else is luck, uh, you know, but people don't want to talk about it, you know. Um, um, but, but yeah, we need to start, we, we need to start treating people as people. They're not, you know, I get seen as someone living with dementia now. I'm not Chris anymore. So we need to start seeing people, especially people with dementia, in care homes and elderly in care homes as people. And we need to be finding out who they are. And we, we, we should know when they're paying a lot of money to be looked after. We should know their likes and dislikes. We should know who they are. I, I mean, if you'd have asked me a year ago, I would have, I would have probably... I shouldn't say this on, on a podcast and admit to this, but I would have kind of started to push back a little bit and start to say, well... I get the sense of we increasingly we know what good care looks like. What actually we need to focus more on now is is putting that knowledge that we've already generated through 10, 20 years of care research into practice. Because so, so often we just don't. And implementation, everything I've been to in the last year has come back to, I've asked this question myself, I've heard others ask it of the presentations we've seen this week is, so what now? Great, you've generated some lovely, interesting information. What are you going to do with it? You can't test an intervention with 32 people in, in the countryside. In with the majority only. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, yeah. And it has to be flexible. Yeah. It has to be not, not designed at a group of people. It has to be flexible and, and fit everyone. And what I think we should do is not say what, what does good care look like. It's what does good care feel like. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it was Nigel, Nigel from the working group um, said... Um, in one of the sessions about doing the mammy test. Mm. If it's good enough for your mum, your mother. Well, but the point I was going to make is I think I've changed, I've kind of changed my mind I, because I think we, we know what good care looks like for a lot of people, but not for everybody or what good care feels like, but not for everybody. But so I, I'd like to see us catching up on stop trying to go for that low hanging fruit. Instead, let's crack on with implementation and catch up and play catch up on research that we know then will support that equality of, of, of care, diagnosis, these other things that we're still clearly not getting right. And it's good that so many research uh, projects have been presented here. I'm going to come back, shall I? We're going to, we're going to move on on the prog on the... Ad- can, can I just add discussion? one thing from research that it is, we all know what good care looks like, but still a lot of research shows that we don't know what good uh, care uh, feels like for for a, a person that we're, we are caring for. Even um, the consistency between me knowing your preferences as a family member is even not that um, high in uh, knowing what my loved one would want at the end or even during their current care. So I guess there's a, a long way to go. Most Most couples don't even talk about that. It's never mentioned. 
Um, we, we, we've, we've, we've discussed it and when um, when our country went into the first lockdown we actually we were hearing all this dreadfulness mm. coming from Italy how there were not enough ventilators and there was so much fear and so we had the conversation because Chris has as you said he's got emphysema and Chris said well if I get if I if I get Covid um, you know yeah take me to hospital keep me comfortable but I don't want a ventilator keep it for somebody else because you were taking the decision that actually we don't know what was going to happen to to drag Chris back from the 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 the, the, the cliff of death yeah, yeah. to bring him back for what quality of life? Mm -hmm. So he took the decision. You know, we discussed it that actually give the ventilator to somebody else. As it happened, we we, we didn't need them yeah, so much in God. our country. Thank yeah, God. The information we, at the time was was that if you had a, a lung condition, you you increased your chances of dying anyway from the COVID. So I thought, well, why why take the ventilators if they're short off someone that might survive with more? But that, that, more goes, that, 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 I mean, that doesn't feel right though, because it's not like big. Because you know, it doesn't feel right. But that's Chris's decision. No, we were yeah. talking. We were talking somewhere else that the doctors were having to make decisions as to who who got what treatment. Actually, this was Chris's decision. And how decision. bad the doctors and nurses his felt. Choice. Mm. So I think that and you I said again about having conversations it. earlier. Yeah. That it, you know, we don't have these conversations. And this is where the palliative care can help so much because it can introduce those conversations to us when we are still fit, able and cognitively um, able to make these types of decisions, to have things written down, to say, actually, if, I, if I'm a vegetarian, please don't let me eat meat yeah. or <laughs> it doesn't really matter, I won't mind. You know, but so I think then you get what the person wants. Palliative, palliative care, a lot of people don't understand what palliative care is. They all think it's about end of life mm -hmm. because that's when a lot of it comes into, mm -hmm. into place. But, but I'm sure you tell me if I'm wrong, but because um, I do, I've done a bit of work with uh, Macmillan and, you know, about dying and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, palliative care was, was first brought in, is it cancer? And it's about giving someone that, that's, that, that's got a good chance of dying has got a limited, life-limited condition to live as good as they can. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be brought in very early on in the illness. And people have got mixed up. Now I like you even more, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's palliative care, which is there to, not just to help the person, I'm sure, but to help the families as well, to live well with a life-limited condition. We've heard stories where the And end of life end of life is a different thing altogether. Yes, yes. The palliative care nurse has been brought in at the last two weeks of life. It's yes. like, too late. Yes. <laughs> it's the yeah, end of life. Actually, you know. actually, research shows that in dementia specifically, yeah. uh, palliative care, specialist palliative care is, is only brought, brought in 14 of days yeah. of, yes. of, yeah. before yeah. that. Yeah. And that's, but, and that, and that's, that's why, actually that's one why, of that's my... That's why people don't want to talk about palliative yeah. care. But then we didn't see a lot of palliative care on, yes. in, on the... That's yeah. what was yeah. that story. No. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I've also, I mean, I re it's quite a long time ago, but I remember there being a bit of a complaint at the time that palliative care, some consultants kind of said, post-diagnosis, right, now we're, we're going to start thinking about palliative care, which people were horrified to to get that information from a consultant quite soon after diagnosis. Yeah, well, we're all going to die one day. Yeah. <laughs> Better to die how I well, want. Better to die you... with my own um, my own choices. You know, it's... Uh, forgive me if, I, if I'm wrong, but it's not about prolonging life. It's about living the life you want. What matters to me? And if all I want is to get out into the fresh air, but it might kill me, but actually that's what I want then let me do that, okay. enable me to do that. I know it's a, a bad analogy, but, but that, that's what I see as palliative care. And that comes back to Chris's point about palliative, the misunderstanding about what palliative care is. Yeah. Chalet. <laughs> but then maybe I will give the word to you. <laughs> no, no, come on. What, no, what else did you? So no. What, did, what else did you pick up? Because I think we only got one from you. Let's no, get we next. didn't. Yeah, um, two actually. No, but uh, I think uh, for now um, we can uh, go to Yoni and we can discuss a little bit further because that was indeed the the, the thing I missed was the palliative care um, mm -hmm. in the program. That was not much. We maybe that's our fault. That, that might be a working <laughs> point for us. To yes. Submit more. Uh, submit more. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, Joni. <laughs> okay, um, great. Yeah, I just I wanted to highlight uh, Simona's uh, point about intersectionality um, and um, the the special or underserved, hard to reach. I'm not I'm not sure if 
I don't like the term hard to reach because actually we are not reaching them instead of they're not reaching us. But um, underserved populations um, are my main interest. And I went to a, a session about intersectionality as well. But also there's this um, interesting um, new interest group, which is founded by um, Clarissa Giebel. Um, who will be focusing or gathering people uh, to work more on the inequalities in dementia. So I guess that's something to raise in this podcast, I think, if you, if you would be interested. Uh, um, that would be really great to have a large group of people working on, on that. Um, and so another point that I would like to raise um, and which was a large part of this conference was also the focus on COVID. Um, and uh, the emergency response in a lot of peop uh, a lot of countries and what we can learn from that. Um, I guess maybe you have other points to add to um, to this, but I guess it, it it has been an important time as well, and it it has some positive outcomes as well um, to get dementia more on the on the map and in national more emphasis on national dementia strategies and plans um, but still it's it's difficult we have seen that in in ukraine and in other um, examples from romania i guess um, yeah i like what they were saying about um the the, the diagnosis going online yeah. um, and you know, doing it through through iPads or phones or whatever, it doesn't take away the the, the personal uh, consultations, but actually we can work smarter. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can we can literally do the diagnosis or whatever through the hybrid systems now. We must not forget that, uh, as has been highlighted, the um, the necessity of touch, of human contact, yeah. of being yeah. in the same room, mm -hmm. and that's what I felt in this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody used the word joy, and I have found it joyous. And I think it's all being together and in the room. But if we can work smarter, then let's take all those benefits that, that we were all forced to do Zoom. You know, nobody likes the e-consults, but yeah. actually they're working. Uh, if we can work smarter, and then that would hopefully leave time for those that need the in-person um, consultations or whatever. Yes. I, I like that. Yeah. And, not, and next to technology also, there was this... Um, example from Ukraine. So in the in the war, um, they had has had this emergency response where they um, gathered a lot of stakeholders um, very quickly, and they started to collaborate really closely um, um, with the national government. And it's still going on. Um, so I guess that's also something that sort of is a positive thing of of. Um, an emergency response that might end up in, in good good quality collaborations and that, that's a good point because this wasn't a, the whilst there's a lot of research presented on it's not entirely a research conference is it i mean a lot of the talks that we get here are from different representative bodies from the charities we had a talk from the um the different the what was it a brand it was fairly new the, the it was a new alzheimer's Association Alzheimer's in Charity Romania or in, in, Ukraine. in the Ukraine yeah. that had barely got going when the Sounds when they ch yeah they just got some materials going they got things going and then the war came and it, they really had to quickly, yeah. pause but so a lot of those talks there was a talk from Alzheimer's Society in the UK about their work with um, with was it South Asian populations and they the, the, the Punjabi the yeah. Punjabi, Punjabi group yeah. that they've they've developed a a diagnostic tool or or, or they're working with the Punjabi community to get um, the people with dementia to come forward or the yeah. families to bring them forward yeah, to, to break awareness. down that stigma yeah. and, and create a specific specific materials for that particular group uh, group of people as well and videos and uh, leaflets and the same that that was the most visited or most used part of their website people stayed on that part of their website for longer compared to to many others. So there were a lot of talks going on which were, were not presenting research, but they were just helping you get an understanding of what what's going on across, particularly across Europe. I mean, it's very much a European thing. There's not a lot of international, you know, there's, there aren't a lot of US people here. However, or Australia the or presence of the WHO is also very, um, yeah, here. 
Um, brain health was on the agenda a couple of times as well, talking about uh, risk factors or modifiable risk factors, particularly. Um, but I, sorry, I'm I'm jumping onto myself. Oh, I'm no, taking no, over. Just go ahead. Joni, okay. what, what else did you have? Um, there was another session about young onset dementia, which I found really surprising. Um, there was. Um, two researchers focusing on um, young carers. Um, apparently two to 8% of all family, young family members under the age of 18 are actually taking care of a person living with dementia, young onset dementia, um, which was really striking to me. Um, and in that session, I, actually there was um, a family member there who um, uh, was a f um, an informal caregiver of for a person living with dementia. And they had two kids, um, one from seven years old and one from 18 years old. And she was sharing how they uh, both um, coped very differently with the uh, diagnosis of their, their father. So it was really interesting, just a, a session and a population that I've never came across in my own research, um, which we can't, definitely can't forget. forget. And there it was important to see the building, br the building bridges kind of um, in input because we have to also think about education and involving schools in our um, program even more to support young people um, raising awareness, but also support them in, in yeah. And that, that understanding of what's, yeah. what's changing. That, that is how we're going to really break down the stigma because the anti-stigma award, the, exactly. the, 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 yes. the gentleman that won it or the oh, team yes. that won it, it was about young children going in and adopting a granny in the care home. But after the project finished, the relationships continued. Now that is getting to the next generation and those children are going to grow up without any of the stigma yeah. that we've all been brought up with. So we won't have to change their stigma, we just educate them younger. And it carried on. I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, that was so I picked up on Alexander Kurz did a he did the plen the very first plenary at the start, didn't he? With very much grabbed hold of that building bridges tagline that this conference has had and talked about how he believes that Southeast Europe will see the largest number of dementia cases in the coming 20 to 50 years because of there are more older women currently in that part of Europe than elsewhere in Europe plus as well um, they there was very and and that's a part of Europe where there are very little psychosocial interventions right now so we're trying to get ahead of of where the problems is and also the um, travel of um, like people immigrating um, yeah, the, the youth migrating. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. The, the, the healthcare professionals from there are also yeah. not staying in the part of the country. And that's a part of the world where, for example, they, uh, an occupational therapist isn't even a recognised yeah. job. Mm -hmm. They don't have occupational therapists. Yeah. So that's a part of Europe. And when we start to look at dementia growth across the world, that's and these aren't the places that are also going to get the first crack at the new treatments, are they? Or the, or the prevention initiatives that are going on in you know, brilliant dementia prevention and brain health initiatives like they have in Scotland and, and other parts of Europe as well. Um, he, he also made the point, though, that building bridges counts and conferences like this are great at this for sharing knowledge. Um, and that there, he picked on 22 project examples that were funded from across Europe. I'll pick a few, AD, Arts, Dem Care, Bridge Project for Social Inclusion, Actimentia, which was about physical activity, Songs for Care, which was a CBT memory thing, Nomad in Macedonian mobile memory clinics, um, Success at Pro Care, Act on Dementia. There's, there's lots here. Um, if you find his talk online, I'm sure there's a big list because all of these had websites and URLs, and if I can find them, I'll include them with the show notes. But he talked about um, how these projects alone didn't improve care. Um, and made the point that we need to bridge the gap to implementation. And I've written down here three times in my notes, implementation, implementation, <laughs> implementation. Because it, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine in so many... At the moment, it seems to either... The onus on implementation seems to fall to the researchers who are passionate about their subject. And then 
But they can't carry on doing that because they're, they're not going to get funded to implement. So they end up having to take another job. Or if you're really lucky, you might get some more research funding to carry it on. Mm-hmm. But it's to do more research when you actually want to do is go away and make that thing happen. Yeah. And so it ends up being a bit of a sideline. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you know, a passion project and not being their main thing. And I think we need to get better at understanding either creating things out of the research that are better connected to policy or implementable or costed and can be mainstreamed. However, I do feel that new funding schemes are uh, putting more emphasis on implementation, valorization, dissemination of your research. Well, some funders, I mean, because I, I absolutely agree. I, mean, I think if anybody can take a lead on this, it probably is the funders. Because yeah. if the funders thought that research was worth funding in the first place, you'd like to think that they take some ownership of the results and support the researchers. I'll say, thank you very much. We'll work with you now, or we'll take this away, and we'll take a lead on trying to make this a, a, a real service or make it part of NHS guidance or Europe part of, uh, you know, something that's adopted in Europe. Uh, so implementation, and that came up key, and I wrote that down several times. I loved his portrayal um, of the drawings with, with the, the island of projects. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and how there was no way that it could reach the, because it was an island, it could not reach the mainland. The mainland of care. The mainland yeah. of care. And they all fell into the sea of despair or something. Oh, the sea of utility. Yeah. The sea of utility. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was brilliant. And that, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. There's so, so many are. Uh, I also saw a talk from um, Stina Saunders from Edinburgh, who works with Craig Ritchie, who's been on the podcast before. They were talk, bringing back that issue again about my, the use of mild cognitive impairment mm-hmm. or MCI, whether that is itself a diagnosis. I think, I think it was interesting. They'd done a lot of survey with, um, with consultant psychiatrists across Scotland and done some qualitative interviews with them to ask, did they use that term? How did they use it? How did they diagnose? And kind of no surprises, but it was interesting in all itself that they came back. There was no consistent approach to this. Some did send people away with MCI. Some didn't. Some had 12-month follow-ups if they used that term. Others didn't. Um, and there was a general view that they, I think they interviewed 19 old age psychiatrists. Most used MCI, but not all. 50-50 considered it a diagnosis. Others considered it a di- description of symptoms. And only half, if, if they gave, told people MCI, only half of the consultants they interviewed actually discussed the potential for a dementia diagnosis off the back of MCI. So you go away saying you've got MCI, but only half said that might go on to develop dementia. Although we know not everybody gets MCI, goes on to develop dementia. So whether that's right or wrong or not is something that is the subject of research. But only half talked about it. And they all made their diagnosis based on clinical history, um, psychological assessments, and only 50% of them used an MRI. That was my ones. Uh, And they didn't talk about the test results. They talked about the diagnosis. They didn't talk about the individual test results. But one of the sessions was also about how we should communicate those diagnoses. And um, again, how we use language. I think that's also really important, clear language on um, if you have indeed MCI, that you <laughs> there is a percentage that you maybe get into the dementia um, and be honest to people yeah but my favorite one was was sat in I, I, I sat in just to support two of the lads from the working group and it was um, the session about non-alzheimer's dementia and I found that really interesting and um, the, the two work lads from the working group that they didn't talk about um, Louis bodies which Kevin's got or um, frontal, frontal temporal that Petri's got from Finland they spoke about what it did to them how it, how it, how it how, presented how, how, how it presented and what problems they had with it which is totally different than just describing yeah. Louis bodies mm-hmm, yeah. and that was really good and, and about being honest and not trying to cover things up I mean we've, we've been around um, Dementiaville for 10 years now um, and I didn't understand some of the symptoms that were described by by Kevin. 
you know, and I knew Louis Body had this sort of things. They saw, well, not hallucinate. I wouldn't call it hallucinations, but they saw things that weren't there. But the way he described it, it's oh my lord. It ring brings it to life, yeah. doesn't it? It's, it sounds because it does tend to be all about Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah because that is the, the, <laughs> the majority. Hemogenized. Well, yeah, that, yeah. that ties into another talk. I saw was from Francis. Dr. Francis Duffy did a talk where they've taken lots of. Um, uh, longitudinal data and mapped it to try and create algorithms that if you combine this with this, this is more likely to be. Um, can all the d data that we have from these longitudinal studies uh, inform clinical decision making better than we do now to say, uh, also to get specifically to uh, a particular diagnosis? Because at the moment they were saying that so many people who were given a diagnosis, actually the clinicians can't say why they'll perform three sets of tests on two different people and they'll give the tests might be the same but they'll give one person a diagnosis and not the other because it's a bit of a gut thing I, I was going to, it's from the exactly conversation that that's a, um, a clinician's skill they're just gut instinct they just they this can one kind doesn't of be seem sat, right to me, but this one does. Exactly, sat in front of two different people with the same test results, but they'll give one person say that you were diagnosed and somebody else weren't because it was a clinical decision and they were the experts and trying to see if they can better use technology to replicate what at the moment only somebody can do. It'd be fascinating if these do. I mean, we t constantly talk about AI and machine learning, particularly from your, your group of colleagues, uh, Simone. What else, Chris? Was well, there anything else, Chris and Jane? I liked watching all the anti-stigma um, presentations um, and seeing what countries are doing to try and, you know, um, get rid of stigma. I, I thought that was really good. And I, I loved the way that, like you say, it's all information sharing, isn't it? And that, and that encourages other countries. Well, they're doing it and they're doing it and they just got accolades. And so we need to be doing it. Mm -hmm. And it is about keeping up with the, the next door neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I so I and, and I thought some of them were really really good, really good. Uh, and I think it, some of the countries were here were definitely kind of looking to where there were lots going on. There've been lots of talk from, particularly from like the the Netherlands and from yeah. Germany. Yeah, I mean, very strong present. I thought the UK was slightly less present here this time. Whether that's a reflection of our position within the European <laughs> Union, I don't know. Well, they, won, they won two posters. And they also come third in the anti-stigma award. So we're low on numbers, but up there. High on, high on. <laughs> but it's talent. nice to see. It's nice to see Italy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it, 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 dementia isn't talked about in Italy. At all. No. No. And so it's great to see that they're really trying to do something to change that. And I think it's also it was such a positive campaign they mm. made with the music and yeah, yeah, it was very nice to see. And I think yeah. it's also great that all these things are, are displayed here because we don't have to invent the wheel ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can really learn from each other. There were lots of good posters on yeah. arts, music, yeah. culture. Do go look at them. I, I'm sorry, we, we obviously aren't gonna have time to talk about everything we've seen here today. But Jane? But I did like, um, was it Professor Visha, um, the tall blonde lady um, who was talking about the biomarker. She was on the plenary yesterday afternoon and she was talking about the biomarkers and, and where it could go. And, and it wasn't a, a great scientific, you know, it wasn't a massively in-depth scientific um, presentation, uh, but she was saying about how, how about diagnosing. But what I really liked, what I took away from that was, um, from, from my own level, I'll never be, you know, a clinician, but the fact that the biomarkers that were there, we can actually discounts if you don't have the biomarker in your blood you can discount some of the uh, some of the dementia you know for, for instance um, Alzheimer's disease if you, you've got the blood marker but they did then explain that there's something that's come from was it it wasn't multiple sclerosis but it was something that sounded similar and I'm not a scientist uh, whatever it was but they could use that but they've actually noticed that that's in people with dementia so they've not repurposed, but they've found something in a different discipline that they can use oh, yeah. for dementia um, to actually say that there is something going on here, uh, so to do more investigations. But what I really liked about that was the fact that you're more likely to get an accurate diagnosis. My concern was that um, if, if you've got, you know, some GPs still don't like to mention the word dementia. Um, and my worry was if, they, if the blood test says, no, there's no Alzheimer's disease there, then go away, 
you know, come back later. Um, but what I really saw the benefits of that is, okay, we can discount that one so we know to look for a different one. And mm-hmm. um, she was talking about all the different types of, of scans that you can do. Uh, it, actually, it was in the side room scans and what you can need and all the different tools they've got. Uh, and I like the fact that then they're going to be more accurate because worse than getting a diagnosis of dementia is getting a misdiagnosis mm-hmm. of dementia because you just don't know where you are. Or as we've heard, if you get the if you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you actually have Lewy body. They can give you um, medications that would virtually, you know, kill you. Mm-hmm. So I really like that aspect, and that was the most scientific it got, um, you know, beyond my level. And, and important to dis to discount things that it could be that aren't dementia, that are still treatable. So because yeah. we've seen yeah. some awful stories in the news recently where people were misdiagnosed for, instead of something that could have been treated. Um, I think we probably are going to have to wrap up. I'm looking at the clock and and um, we've been on an hour and seven minutes so far. So that definitely, we, we're definitely coming towards the end. I, I think uh, we should say that the distinct group were here. They, they, there was lots of talks about their technology projects, which were all amazing. You're going to find out more about those in a couple of weeks time. Um, there was also lots of talks about COVID-19. Our own blogger, Clarissa Glebel, gave talks and chaired a session and about the impact of COVID, which I know we've touched a little bit upon uh, today. Uh, I'm, I'm scanning through the agenda as we speak to see if there's anything obvious we should have missed. There were uh, lots of talk about residential care as, as well. Um, the and whole conference was good, Adam. Agitation, <laughs> some quick oral presentations. There was, there was a brilliant session about going to care homes, training the staff to behave differently with the person that was showing some kind of um, distressed behaviour. And that was brilliant. Mm. And it was all about look the person in the eye, because if they're looking at you in the eye, that it's basically it was distraction, but it was teaching the care staff how to distract themselves from their usual response. Yeah. And that in that turn that distracted the person who was showing the distressed responses. I really I really like that home care made the agenda as well. Um, um, domiciliary care never gets it definitely in my view isn't researched enough. Mm. Um, and that's so a massive the, part of looking after someone. Absolutely. And both professionally and, and for the family carers as well. I really think this is probably all we've got uh, time for today. As ever, you can find Twitter links and bios for all of our guests uh, on the Dementia Researcher website. And um, before we wrap up, are there any final takeaways? I have one final call for early researchers. Um, We're organizing this World Cafe online the 5th of December to talk about how we can better support you in your career. So please join us. Adam will definitely share a link. (laughs) We'll put a link in with the show notes. If you're listening to this in 2023 sometime, um, sorry, you'll have missed that, but you'll be able to find the the result. (laughs) Absolutely. It's time to end today's podcast recording. I'd like to thank our brilliant guests, Dr. Joni Gillison, Charlet Dupont, Simone Fielding, Chris Roberts, and Jane Goodrick. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. For anybody who would like to know more, it isn't too late to access the sessions where they've all been recorded and they're going to be uploaded today. So head to the Alzheimer Europe website, alzheimer-europe.org. And if you're a Twitter user, you'll also find a massive amount of information, tweeted pictures, posters, commentary uh, on Twitter using the hashtag 32AEC. I'm Adam Smith, and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher Podcast. See you next time for our Tech and Dementia Week special. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society. Supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.